it's perfectly tying in with uh, the book of Daniel because the book is called The Daniel Dilemma, How to Stand Firm and Love Well in a Culture of Compromise by Chris Hodges. So a lot of this, I just want to give credit to the author that wrote this because a lot of it's taken from here, so it's not all of my message from my own doing. So, Okay, we want to go to the chat, oh, well, first of all, the title I have picked is, uh, Can I See Your ID, Please? It's about Daniel in cha chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Let's read on. It says, The king ordered Aspenaz, chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and of the nobility young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years, and after that, to enter the king's service. Among those, we're, we're going to go on to that, but first, as customary to when you captured someone their idea w would to be to change the names of their captives and so it was basically to show ownership of them and as we go on to verse 6 among those who were chosen were some from Judah Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah the chief official gave them new names so the first one is for Daniel, Daniel's name, which, by the way, the, the meaning of the word or the name Daniel is God is my judge. And they were to give him a new name called Belteshazzar. I always have trouble with that. Which means Bel protect his life. Well, Bel was the uh, Babylonian divinity of God. So, and then to Hananiah, which his name meant Yahweh has been gracious to Shadrach, which means I am fearful of God and under God of Aku. Well, the word fearful here is not a good reverential fear of God. It's a tyrannical, a tyranny, tyranny kind of fear, like very fearful. Mishael is also, his name means, who can compare to my God, to Meshach, meaning, who is like Aku. Now, Aku was the moon god. So, and then Azariah, with, which means, Yahweh helps to Abednego, which means, servant of Nebo, which was the god of learning. So, these new names reject the truth of who God is and who they were. So now when they want to change their identity to th what their names mean. And names do mean a lot, and especially when they named their children in the culture, they met, had a very specific meaning in Hebrew. And so to take that name that was given, that had the meaning to, to direct their worship to God, they wanted to take that and eradicate that and change it to their culture and the new culture. So, the enemy is still trying to do that today and looking for opportunities in our culture to rename us. He is looking to confuse God's children and to uh, help us to be confused about who God is and his goodness toward us and our identities today. Society tries to redefine Gender, gender relationships, marriage, and family units. It's a society that wants to reshape our reliance on God and his holiness. The world is bold and able to speak what they believe in the secular, but sometimes we as Christians become fearful and silent instead of speaking up to about what our identity is. And while Christians are afraid to voice truth in our faith, we can be apologetic 
And so we don't want to cause any discomfort or divisions or conflict. And sometimes like, it's good to not want to cause any conflict, but the thing is about what we need to do as Christians, just like the book says, how to stand firm and love well. We need to love well. It's not about pointing the finger and self-righteousness. It's about loving those and still standing firm in what we believe and hopefully bringing them to the truth of the love of God. We can be swayed even to compromising our identity in Christ and who we are to become and our purpose to share the gospel. When we start to wonder, hmm, who am I? And so we can see this happening in the culture of giving us questions of who are you really? And I like how you just said about um, our identity and a name is we need to really remember who we are now. And I, we were asked the question in the book, who are you now? Because we have to think, well, we had a past of who we were, but now when we're born again in Christ, we have a new identity. But it's to the good. And in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, is who our identity really is in. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you to the nations. So we are who God made us to be. And I think it's very interesting how he knew us before we were even formed. So he had, a, he had our identity already planned for us, a purpose for us. He already, like we talked in Sunday school, he predestined a plan for us to be saved through Jesus Christ. And it's not that we were only the ones chosen, it's the free will to choose and have that plan that was already pre-planned for us to have that salvation in Christ. So you are who God made you to be, a unique beloved child of the universe, your creator, your redeemer and savior that created us. And we have a unique purpose and a plan for this specific time. So did you ever wonder, why are you here now? Sometimes, I, like I used to, I, I often share this with people, and it's funny, but yet it's true. I used to think as I was getting older and growing up and then later on in life thinking, boy, when I see all these bad things that happened in the world, I'm glad I'm in this time. And I'm thinking, things are really great, because I didn't really get to see any of those bad points until now, like we saw 9-11 and other things happening in our lifetime. But it's just that I'm recognizing every generation sees all kinds of changes in their society, things that are changing the way we look at things and how we accept things and how we reject things. But we have to realize that God is the one who has a purpose for us. Each one has a unique pur purpose. Cause, and it's for a specific purpose. So even as young as a child, all of you kids in here are young, you have a purpose. You may not realize it now. It may just be to go give someone a hug. It may just be someone... You want to say, hey, can you want to come to church with me? We're on the playground. I know someone that just had a friend, and she prayed with her the sinner's prayer at the playground. Isn't that neat? Because God placed you for a spe specific time, place, and a purpose for that moment. Okay, Romans 18 says, we are co-heirs, we are heirs with uh, God, co-heirs with Christ, and we are God's child. So that's who we are. But the enemy is good at trying to rename us, just like they did with uh, Daniel and his friends. I won't mention all the names, but he tried, we, they try to rename us in society to maybe, if it doesn't agree. And so we don't want to com be combative. We want to love people and accept them as a person but, Lord, we need to just be who we really are and not let them change our identity. So I don't know if I'm ex explaining that the right way. It's not coming out. But anyways, we accept false labels sometimes. 
and the definitions of who we are when others make standards of how we measure up or we don't, like uh, disabled or plus size or redneck. <laughs> I remember thinking when we lived out in the mountain, we were called hicks from the sticks. So, but anyway, the names that you allow to label you often title the scripts that you live by. So the enemy also likes to remind us of past failures. Like saying maybe that you were saying you're a liar, you're a failure, you were this, you were that. But see, our identity in Christ is who we are now, is we are loved by God, we are beloved, and we are his creation. Now I want to I love this, uh, this is a saying from W.C. Fields. It says, it ain't what they call you, it's what you answer to. <laughs> I like how it ain't what you call, they call you, it's what you answer to. So the truth is when we allow him to control our lives, he gives us a new identity. You think about Jacob was the swindler, became Israel, the nation of Israel. Of Abram became Abraham, Sarai, Sarah. Then we have Saul became Paul. Levi became Matthew. So there's a change in who we are when we meet the Lord Jesus. We can find our identity in wrong places. And I'm just going to read what he said here. I thought it was cute because he was saying about how he had surgery and he was laid up for a, a good while. He said, as I... Um, as I started thinking, thinking about aging, suddenly I saw a new gray hair every morning when I looked in the mirror. I also noticed a few wrinkles that I had that I don't remember seeing them before. Have you ever had that happen to you? Yeah, yeah. Well, my surgery made me slow down, and when I did, my eyes were open. And while I still thought of myself as relatively a young man, my body had started sending me some other signals. Suddenly, you think about why people do go through this midlife crisis and things that change. Sometimes people go for a sports car, others get a divorce, or else they start uh, looking to color their hair and do all kind of Botox and whatever because they're worried about how they look. And some, that's one of the ways that uh, we can put our identity in the wrong place, the place of how we look and our appearance. When we're not connected to our God-given identities, we'll plug into other outlets to define ourselves. Physical appearance is one of them. We want to remain beautiful and youthful. After all, isn't that what society says we should be? We should stay young, never age, and look beautiful. Because that's what sells. Guess what, though? I think after COVID, being home, a lot of us women got to decide gray's okay. <laughs> I mean, really, it's the new in thing to do, and I love it. So now we have an excuse not to have to worry about that. And even the, what do they say, the 10-pound COVID weight gain or something like that, I think, <laughs> I think we've had some issues with, I know I have. Um, but the Lord does not look upon, uh, on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's what 1 Samuel 16 says. So others of us will look to ourselves based on performance, and we always look at what we can accomplish in life. We always, and sometimes we like to put those little PhD, MDs, whatever, doctorates and things in front of our names and, and to show that we've accomplished stuff because it's never enough no matter how much we achieve or how famous we become because the emptiness could still remain. Like Ecclesiastes 2.11 says, Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. It's only when we embrace our true identities that work becomes purposeful and meaningful. Finally, there's one attempt to define ourselves is also by our possessions and money. And Luke 12, 15 talks about um, not chasing after money. It doesn't give us life because greed and all that. Okay, now let's get into some interesting questions. We need to ask ourselves these questions. 
The first one was, who am I? What is my identity, my true identity? And what is my role as a follower of Christ? Our role as a follower of Christ, I think, too, is we sh- it's to bring those to the loving, compassionate love of Christ. It's not to point at and find fault with people. He gives an example about he went to a tailor to have a suit made because someone gave him a birthday gift of a new suit to be made. But the man had all these false gods and things on his wall, and he said something about the fact that, well, you seem pretty nice for a Christian guy because most people I meet aren't like you. And he said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, the other man that was a pastor or whatever, he took me out to dinner and wanted to tell me all about what was wrong with all my gods and that I'm just going to go to hell instead of showing love and compassion. So he invited him to his church. And he said, oh, really? Because he seemed nice. He agreed to go. And here he brought his cousin with him, and they both got saved because the approach was different. It wasn't trying to beat them over the head with sin and you're going to hell. It's to show them that there is loving kindness, forgiveness, and the truth will reveal that to them. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We're just there to do the job of the vessel, being in there at the right place for the purpose God called us to. Another question. Am I willing to stand firm and be who God called me to be when others are different from me and oppose my faith? That's a tough one. Am I willing to stand firm when other people oppose me and don't agree with me? Daniel did that in a world culture that was idolatrous and against everything that Daniel stood for. But yet he still prayed with the open window. He still did not deny his God. He still did it openly as in to influence people, not to go out and be out there advocating. So his actions were actually showing more of who he was. The other question is, am I willing to risk what people think of me to stand firm in my identity? That's hard because a lot of us don't want people not to like us. We don't like rejection. I know I don't. And sometimes that keeps me quiet and silenced when I should speak up anyway. We need to please God, not man. Another question. How do I relate to those who do not know Jesus? How do I relate to them? I think the first thing that we have to ask is, am I talking with people that I don't, are not in my circle? Like, we're used to coming to a church where we're all together and we think the same way and we worship God, but then there's times, I'm not saying to hang out with other people that are a bad influence, but we need to influence them by just being there and listening and learning where those opportunities are to speak about what God has done for us. Because a lot of times people will listen to a, a, just a relatable story about yourself. And that opens the door, I think. And the last one is, how do I handle the constant change in the world? Hmm. I think, too, that like the one time, that I, other message that I had brought about staying on truth, standing for truth, truth, truth is truth, it explains itself. I think of how Jesus, when the Pharisees and the people all came at him and tried to trick him and, and come against him, didn't he just answer simply the truth? He didn't try to persuade them or tell them what was wrong with them and why they shouldn't have done what they did. He just spoke the truth. And this, the word spoke for itself. God's word never returns void. When he has a purpose for that word, his word, it will... It will do something, a purpose. So when culture shifts, we can become, we can go to extremes. We can either feel frustrated, angry, resentful. And so we want to actually just go and say, forget it. I just want to shut the door, stay in my house. I don't want to turn on TV because I just can't take it. 
because you hear about all the changes all every day in our media, and we can't avoid it no matter what. But isn't it funny how we still gravitate to it? <laughs> so we've got to be careful what we're listening to and what we're watching. And the thing is, we can be so angry we want to hide away, or become, we could become so wary that we accept the compromi compromise just to avoid the conflict. Just, okay, just let it go, let it be, whatever it is. But we have a voice in our world as people on the earth. God, he gave us the great commission to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Holy Spirit. And, te you know, that is our great commission. So we can't be silent in the culture because it's different. We need to change the culture, not let it influence us. And I like what he wrote in this book here. This is, these, this is a quote that he wrote. He says, truth without grace is mean, because you need that grace. But grace without truth is meaningless. Truth and grace together is medicine. I like that, because you can't just have truth without grace, because it's very hard and harsh. And don't... People dis back away when you give it too hard, you know, too much. But when you put the seasoned salt with it with grace, it's more edible and tasty. <laughs> so the good news is we can be calm in the midst of a cultural storm. See, Daniel did not waver in his faith and his faithfulness despite being in the midst of another culture. He displayed his commitment to God and honored him despite the threats. And God gave him favor with four kings because he was obedient to the Lord, and they saw that, and they respected that. So even with that, in a, in a foreign land, in a different culture, anything against God, God gave him favor with the kings to be in high government. Um, even bringing... Si uh, Cyrus that led the Jewish people back to rebuild the temple. So, D um, and just like Daniel in a foreign land, we are in the world but not of the world. We can influence those around us by our actions, but it takes humility and compassion, and it takes dependence on God because it is not easy. <laughs> and. How many times have you been around someone that you just feel so differently about what they're saying and you want to just say, that's not right. But it's like God's telling you in your head, like, no, calm down. Just speak, listen, and then just be careful how you speak because you don't want to cause a, an argument. You want to bring them closer. His actions glorified God. He wasn't trying to prove that he was right, but his actions did have the influence. So the changing culture can sweep us downstream away from God and who he created us to be. The enemy is always looking for ways to label us and rename us. Did you ever have a nickname in school? We were talking about this. Even nicknames, like scrawny, four eyes. I don't know. Some of them are stupid, but they relate to something about your character or your looks or something. But how many times does that stick with you for a while? Like he says, like gum on the bottom of your shoe. <laughs> Does it take, you, you don't want to take that with you because it can actually uh, change the way we live, like he said. So we need to be able to be strong enough to swim against that current that's always trying to draw us down the stream and label us. And our goal should be to represent the love of Christ, but being honest. Because it is hard to be truthful you don't want to hurt people, but you want to be honest because it could mean their life. Like, but I, just, I was thinking while I was sitting here about, okay, when we need to show our ID, it shows our name, our address, a picture of us. So I was just thinking, God gave us a new name. We are his in Christ. We are his beloved. These are names that I feel like we are ch his child. We are his beloved. We are his masterpiece, his workmanship. We are ambassadors that represent him. We are justified. We are redeemed. And there's many others. 
Our new address is the kingdom of God, heavenly bound. Our picture is new because we are re- remade in his image. And if you ever have a service person or someone come to your house anymore, if they have to have that badge clicked on there because it has to prove that's who they really are. Otherwise, you're not going to let them into your house, right? Just something that came to me, and I thought, well, that's true. That's how our, that's our new identity. That's what the, the new, like Terry and I were saying, the real ID. How come it's called the real ID now? Didn't ID just matter before? Now it's the real ID. Okay, there was a false ID before, but now there's a real ID. So now our real ID is in Christ Jesus, our new identity. So we need to... And we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That was the other thing. Because just as Glenda was saying that in Sunday school, we are sealed with that mark. It's almost like it's laminated, sealed, stamp of approval. We are his. So don't let anyone try to talk you out of, well, I remember you when. You can't be changed. I don't believe you. Or these things that try to label you from your past or label you because you don't agree with maybe what their view is. But we have our new identity, the real ID in Christ Jesus. And like I said, culture is always changing, but we don't need to change because God's word is true forever. It stands true forever. And we are in that kingdom of his, and we just need to represent him in a way that glorifies God. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you, God, that you have given us your identity through Jesus Christ. Thank you for your loving kindness and for the death on the cross, Jesus, that you died for each one of us, knowing our name, making us who you already meant us to be from the beginning and what we are becoming to live into that name. We thank you, God, for your provision and sanctifying us. We give you glory and honor for everything we We give our lives to you, and we commit our lives to you leading our lives. And we just pray that we will be an an example to those to bring them into the kingdom and be with each one of us here and our families, guide and protect us throughout the week. Be with those who are ill. Lord, we we just pray your healing hands upon them. Be with those who are grieving. Help them to see you through the light of Jesus no matter what the circumstances are. In Jesus we pray. Amen.